Logos is the icon of the Father, and man is the icon of God. We are the image of God. Dire Wave 3. Dire Wave 3.
Dire Wave 3. Dire Wave 3.
dire wave. Three. Science comes out of medieval universities. This may be totally lost on modern people, but no, actually modern science comes out of universities. Guess where universities come from? Byzantium. What is the theology of Byzantium? Orthodoxy. The longest running empire, the most successful economic empire in the history of the world. All right, welcome. You're here. We've made it. Um, I'm not in jail. I'm not. I haven't lost all my belongings due to all the lawsuits. <laughs> oh man, um, we're here. We're having fun, and we're going to do a stream that we haven't totally done. I mean, we've kind of hinted at this stream uh, quite a bit the last year, and. Now I think it's just obviously the time to do it. And 2022 is going to be lit. It's going to be lit with different foci. But I can tell you that two of the foci for 2020 are going to be Roman Catholicism and Calvinism. As you know, we didn't uh, do a whole lot of Calvinism in the last year. We did a couple streams with David Patrick Carey where we got into overall you know two hour three hour critiques of calvinism and that worked out good um they they're, they bore a lot of fruit um 10 20 000 people across various platforms saw those not counting the audios and then you know we had a lot of calvinists reach out a lot of Cal i have a former calvinist buddy who wrote a book <laughs> about the orthodox view of predestination so you know we're, we've seen a lot of fruit in the last year especially and as the audience grows that's why we're seeing the effect that we are seeing so ultimately yes that's up to divine providence but as paul says we are co-laborers and he will brag paul says i will brag about you my labor in christ that is the people that he helped to convert so thankfully we've seen so far, at least, thousands of converts, uh, even though William Albrecht, Albrecht says that's completely made up. There, there are no converts. It's all a fraud. It's all a scam. Even though I said you could, like, within a minute, click into Discord and get a survey of, I don't know, 8,000 almost people in there. Most of whom are uh, either inquirers or people who are catechumens or are now converted. And so, you know, we had seen that tremendous growth in the last two and a half almost three years of discord which again was all kind of uh, not expected and that's not even counting you know the other outlets that we have so uh really thankful for that we got so many awesome educated people in the discord and we've got uh you know really solid clergy apologists in there people with degrees we're not talking about a reason in theology fan group that's full of jokes about semen uh we're talking about people who actually talk about the issues and the theology now as everybody i'm sure has seen there was a lot of drama this week this is not going to be a drama stream those guys kind of rely on that stuff every now and then we do make it a point to reply to drama when it is necessary and everybody who's followed this channel out of uh you know in total i had to remove some older videos and move them over to rockfin because they were just too edgy for the soft softness over on this side of the internet but all of that uh, old content is still available over at my rockfin and there's unique material that's uploaded over at rockfin so you can go over there to see all that kind of stuff somebody was asking about that a minute ago um but some stuff you know you just it's not fitting to discuss over here by the way i don't even host lord voldemort's fourth hour albrecht says that's, that's made up but that's all made up I guess I photoshop. I, they're all fishing pages. <laughs> like I photoshopped all the video. It's all uh, deep fake, right? So it's not actually me. It's my face over uh, Lord Jones's face. Uh, that's a, apparently what the Roman Catholics think. That I'm not joking. That's what he said. It's all made up. Even that is made up. So that I think that this is actually signifying kind of uh, a new phase. Like their their system. Their channels are unraveling and to rely on just ludicrous claims like that uh and the the replies from you know who i mean it's just 
I think it's kind of almost we're at the verge of victory here in terms of like they're almost done, right? I mean, it's like meltdown level. I mean, if dude is like claiming that he's getting death, T H R E A T S, and if he claims that uh, he's going to sue me for defamation when like he apparently he's never actually talked to a lawyer about this because like what you can't sue somebody for them believing that you use sock puppets <laughs> i mean this is just crazy right uh has he is he gonna it's like a boomer approaching like i'm gonna sue the twitter for them main posts on twitter right i'm gonna contact the google and have my content removed i'm gonna it, does, it doesn't work like that dude it's like boomers not understanding the internet. Welcome, by the way, to being a public figure, by the way, you goober. You can't, if you're a public figure, you know how hard it is to prove defamation? Yeah. See, and I know this because I've had multiple harassers in the past that I've talked to multiple various lawyers about. So I've already heard all about this multiple times for many years. So you can't really prove any of those things and hardly any lawyer will take those kinds of cases but I think everybody who is uh, at least reasonably sane realizes that a lot of this meltdown is because of the inability to deal with the issues so you know we saw last year Lofton implying that Ubi was a PEDO uh, no evidence at all uh, but of course he, he does the very things that he says everybody else is doing and he's done this for two or three years now. Uh, I showed where he was trying to get uh, Father Deacon defrocked by emailing the diocese over somebody making a joke about him. So this is like a super thin-skinned dude. And anybody that thin-skinned is not going to make it as a public figure because it doesn't matter what your positions are. It doesn't matter how cool you appear or try to be. You're going to have people who are going to obsess over you and try to come at you. And you have to just be able to deal with this stuff. But some people just, they have meltdowns. They can't deal it. They can't deal with criticism. They can't deal with uh, people who make fun of them even, right? They, they'll, they'll say that jokes are slander. Now that's, that's just satire. That's just humor, man. You got to get used to being made fun of. <laughs> I'm sorry that you're that much of a beta that you, you feel like you have to try to take people to court for making fun of you. I mean, that's just pitiful, right? So, you know, Reason and theology is that's that's the model that they chose right after what after they refused to debate Ubi after Ubi basically destroyed Ibarra uh, in multiple videos. Uh, it really just fell apart and turned into a drama stream. Um, not every stream, but a a stream relying upon let me feed off of anybody with a larger audience is what it turned into. And he gets, what, 40, 50 live viewers now when two, three years ago he would get, what, three, 400? So, yeah, I mean, that's just what happens when you don't rely on the logic, the argumentation, objective facts. You're just repeating quote minds. You're just repeating old hash, rehashed material that Ubi already dealt with. Like both Trent and uh, Reason of Theology's replies, a lot of that was already dealt with in Ubi's replies. And it's like, so obviously they didn't watch any of that, right? And so I think what happens is that these audience, they just rely on, if I can make uh, Jay look bad, if I can make the ortho bros look bad, right? That's what he's going to fall back on. The problem with that, though, is that you the audiences that follow drama and audiences that if you rely on this as your model, I'm going to give him a little free uh, consultation here to reason and theology. When you rely on that, it doesn't keep converts and it comes off as uh, a desperate attempt to you know maintain whatever he's up to over there whatever that thing is with the cult that he's starting in his garage to saint maximus fellowship or whatever that is so um let's get into the issues that's enough on that i mean if you if you want to look at the you know the uh video that david did you can go over to david erhan uh formerly david the real med white channel and david just put up a video basically outlining the entire discussion right and an issue and the problems with um lofton's modus operandi constant underhanded activities and i mean just the idea that making fun of somebody making jokes they, they think this is slander it's not what slander is dude 
I mean, it's just, it's, it's pitiful really. But so what we're going to do tonight is uh, that promise stream that I talked about a lot in the past year, which I didn't really get around to. We did a, a really hefty in-depth stream um, last year or the year before where we went deep into um, set of a contism. And we did multiple streams last year, you know, with Snack, David, Father Deacon, um, Ubi, where we got into papal claims, quote mines, Vatican one. So I'm not chiefly going to be dealing with quote mines tonight. We're going we're to look at a few of the claims, but what the, the largest of the Roman system rests on is of course, Vatican one. Now, Roman Catholics always refer to Vatican one as kind of, well, we know Vatican one settled the issue of the papal debate, but hardly any of them have actually read the documents. Now, when I say the documents, I do not mean EWTN's two, three page summary, which we're going to look at first because we're going to see that what's in EWTN's summary of past returnus here, which is abridged. Notice that abridged leaves out, not intentionally. I don't think they were intentionally doing this. I just think they wanted to give the basics leaves out what is, uh, if you go over to papalencyclicals.net, the full treatise, right? So the full thing printed out is about 15 or 20 pages. Probably most of them just skipped over to read this or they, you know, picked up something like uh, Ott's Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma and turned to page 279, which we'll look at in a minute. So this is going to be a little long. It's going to be a little boring, but it, we got to do it this way because there's no other way to look at the actual text and the actual documents. So then we're going to get to some of the text in Denzinger and we're going to look at the canons of the councils again that demonstrate the mind of the church is not Vatican I. And we're going to, yeah, I'll mention some of the uh, casustry and some of the sophistry and deflections that they always go to. And I know because I made all these same arguments. I did all the same deflections, all the same casustry when I was Roman Catholic. And that's because most of the time the context is not given, right? It's just like when we saw Anthony Rogers trying to prove uh, faith alone in the church fathers when Perry over on Sam Schmoon's channel did that five hour lecture deconstructing this is just a total demolishing of the fact showing that these are quote minds. And the problem with a quote mine is it's not wrong to proof text, but a quote mine is where we're just kind of cutting out of the context, anything that gives the appearance of something that will imply Vatican one, because hardly any of the texts in the first thousand years even the ones that speak of the primacy of honor and the role of the, of the bishop in the can, Roman bishop in the in canonical, canonical procedure, none of them amount to the claims that we will see are in Vatican I. And one of the key issues there is the universal uh, magisterium, both in its uh, ordinary and extraordinary form. Now, Lofton did a stream replying to that, uh, basically trying to make all these nuanced ways that Vatican II clarifies that. Um, that's nice that there's all these clarifications in Vatican II, but I'm more interested in the actual theologians of the church who comment on the issue and not some random dude on YouTube, right? People that have actual uh, prowess within the Roman Catholic Church in terms of theological recognition. And so we'll look at one of the theologians over at 1 Peter 5, who gives uh, basically the same explication of what universal magisterium, both ordinary and extraordinary, means. It's, a, it's, a, it's the same stuff I said, right? Um, and in order to understand that, we're going to have to look at what Vatican I actually says uh, in those texts, not from the abridged version over here at EWTN that probably most people look at when they search this and the reason i know this is because it took me a long time back in the day to actually find the full text of vatican one before i had denzinger like way back when i was in my 20s as a trad catholic and so yes the the papal encyclicals.net version is the full version and it's about 15 or 20 pages but most of them do not read that right that's the point i'm trying to make then we're going to look over here at um the canons and we're going to go through each of these and see how they do not line up with Vatican I. And I'm going to probably uh, repeat this many times because these guys don't listen to the arguments, right? 
they twist, they malign, they just ignore. It goes in one ear out the other, especially with a bar up. I've talked to no, I've known a bar up for I don't know five or six years. We've interacted for a long time, many times, and so that's really the source of frustration. Is not that um, everybody just wants to be nasty, but what happens is that when there's obstinacy and just not listening, and then twisting, and then then it turns into nasty stuff after everything was perfectly fine for a while. Now, of course, they say, well, y'all were the ones that were mean. Yeah, um, not really. I mean, we've, we've gone into that many times. We're not going to do the drama. Um, we're going to look at just the flat out, straight up documents. And then we're going to play a little bit of David's video again, because it's so good and because it really outlines one easy way to prove this. So even if we don't, want to dive into, you know, piles and piles of papal documents and all these printouts and all these essays. Uh, one of the easiest ways to demonstrate why this doesn't work is precisely the evolution of how Eastern Catholicism has progressed. So this is Byzantine, right? Catholics, Uniates, etc., And how the reversal of positions on St. Photius and St. Gregory Palamas uh, and even some of the Uniates who uh, 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 revere uh, basically all of the of the the uh, pillars of Orthodoxy. So even Saint Mark of Ephesus, right? I mean, amazing to think that um, you can oppose Florence, but Roman Catholics will accept you as a saint, and then others not. And so what we begin to see is that really what the Roman Catholic Church is, is a vast umbrella that is supposed to be a unified system and a system that provides clarity. And it does not do that. In fact, its only strength is in affirming the papacy as an end in itself. Meanwhile, you can do and have any of the views that you want. Now, that's a long time criticism that Roman Catholics, of course, scoffed at especially during the more traditional pre-Vatican II periods. However, since Francis, that criticism, and Vatican II, I mean, that criticism has really hit home, right? Because nobody can honestly, especially in our day, especially in the years of the Francis pontificate, say that Francis has been a source of unity. I've never seen, I mean, I came into Roman Catholicism under John Paul II back in the day, back in 2003, in the Novus Ordo, by the way, uh, before I went to the, tra the Trad Latin Mass. And at that time, I mean, it was still a burgeoning Trad movement that was not large, but I would say, I don't know, maybe, you know, most uh, large cities had at least one SSPX chapel or maybe an FSSP chapel, right? So the fissure was not near what it is now. And the reason I bring that up is that David's video makes just an astounding point, uh, not just this video, but the other one that he did on Ibarra's Fatal Flaw. And it really uh, addresses the recent Lofton video on the issues with the, the Moscow Patriarchate in Africa in the easiest, simplest way. And that is just simply to say that if you think that looking at a church and seeing a schism amongst patriarchates is itself an argument against that ecclesiology or that church, then by your own definition, the first thousand years of Christianity, which was, which was united is thereby flawed because there were divisions amongst the patriarchates in the first thousand years. Do you see how silly and stupid this argument is? He has relied on this argument, he, Anabara for years, and it is just completely dumb. I want to, I want to be, be clear that you get this argument, right? Because it's so obvious that some, it flies over some people's heads and they don't understand it, right? So the argument is the Orthodox Church is fraught with these problems of unity because of internal disagreements between patriarchates. And that itself is an example, a way to show that because the Moscow Patriarchate is against the EP, the Orthodox Church and its ecclesiology can't be the case, aren't true, and are missing the office of the papacy. But wait a minute. On that view, on their view as Roman Catholics, for the first thousand years, the church is loosely speaking united, 
and yet it contains divisions and schisms with patriarchates and condemned popes, and it had the papacy, and yet there were these gigantic schisms. So do you see how this argument turns back on these goobers own head? It's just such a brain dead argument. It's like these people literally have never had an epistemology class, right? Lofton's like, well, I had a couple philosophy classes back in the day. I don't think you had any, and maybe you had one, right? But I mean, these, and the reason I say that is because if you had had basic, basic logic, basic philosophy classes, basic epistemology, you would know and you would be able to see the flaws in these stupid arguments, right? Like David has a video, which we'll pull up here in a second, illustrating this point uh, precisely about Ibarra where he uses this argument. I want you to see this. We're going to kick off with this. We might as well just kick off with this because it's, it's a really great point. Where Ibarra, uh, and David, David included it in his like 10 worst arguments <laughs> video, right? So let's, let's listen to a little bit of this so argumentation. The serpent is, who the fuck he was a serpent? Talk. Man, well, well, that, am I the only person sick of that dude? Well, well, the funny thing about the serpent is, like, if you're a snake, like, you like how, how do you speak? Like, how does the snake speak? Anyway, um, so let's look at this fatal flaw argument. It's essentially repeated by all of this crew as if it's a good argument. And again, it, what it shows is just a reliance on um, their audience not paying attention or not looking into these things or not thinking about this, right? So let's be really clear what this argument is. And you're going to notice Ibarra make a different version of it, right? Ibarra is not going to be talking about uh, the Moscow patriarchy, but it's the same argument at work here. So let's, let's let David make a few points here. Because I came across this comment by online apologist Eric Ibarra. Now, this is someone that we know. And the comment is mind-numbingly stupid. Um, I will be... Somebody said Lofton is getting a PhD. I, I don't even know if that's true or not, but my point, by the way, there's a lot of dumb PhDs. My point was that uh, he doesn't understand what it means to justify claims and to, and to do good argumentation. That's what I'm trying to say. So you can get a PhD in all kinds of things. Remember when I debated JF? Well, JF has a PhD. Does having a PhD mean the argumentation was good? No, of course not. So... I don't, who cares about a PhD, really? Very harsh in this because this is one of the stupidest comments I have ever read concerning orthodoxy ever in my life. For those who don't know, Eric Ibar is a Roman Catholic papal lawyer, apologist. Uh, his main his main work is, is that better? Somebody said there's an echo. Collecting a bunch of quotes from uh, church fathers that speak nice things about Rome and acting as if that means they're defending the council of uh, the first council of the Vatican. That's really what he does. But when he goes outside of that, you see what happens with him. And I will read this this writing really quickly. And then I will step by step go across what's wrong with this writing. So he says that there is a bit of a jungle waiting for the convert in either communion. For while we speak of orthodoxy in the singular, there are in fact orthodoxies if you respect other Eastern bodies such as the Assyrian Church of the East and the Syriac, Coptic, Ethiopic, Indian Orthodox. The Byzantines famously stuck it out with the West until the second millennium, but there are earlier breaks within the East. Of course, today there is a severance between Moscow and Constantinople, Antioch and Jerusalem, the significance of which continues to be downplayed in light of some category of half-medium schism. And finally, the true... Okay, so there you go. There is uh, Eric pointing out basically this argument, right, that the Moscow Patriarchate uh, versus the EP, which, by the way, people, we've covered that in previous podcasts a long time ago, and, and I actually talked about this being a problem 10 years ago, right? I was talking about the problems with Bartholomew. Uh, so it's not like this is some, like like they discovered this big, like, whoa, we got him. There's like this problem. This is a problem that has plagued the church since the earliest days. Divisions and schisms between patriarchates. Do these people not understand that Constantinople I, as we've pointed out many times, was called, convoked, convened, outside of communion with Rome, dogmatized the Trinity on the basis of the Cappadocians. And this was presided over by St. Meletius, who also died outside of Rome. 
And the Roman Catholic Church today accepts Constantinople I, the Second Council, as dogmatic, guided by the Holy Spirit, and presided over by a saint who died out of communion with Rome. How in the world does that match up with Unum Sanctum, which says that no one can be saved outside of communion with the Bishop of Rome? How does that match up to Cantate Domino in the Council of Florence, which says that even if you're a martyr, if you do this martyrdom for the name of Christ outside of communion with the Bishop of Rome, it does not save you. You, you are damned. Of course, they'll just say, well, but Vatican II clarified this on the basis of evolving dogma. And we're going to look at some uh, articles that discuss the living magisterium and how it evolved. And we're going to look at um, Ott saying the same thing too. But at the same time as it evolves and the understanding new information, oh, well, it wasn't clear in the first issue, but oh, actually it was. Everyone always believed in Roman supremacy, infallibility, and jurisdiction. If that was the case, then, well, if, if one of those is the case, then the other one can't be the case. It can't be the case that it was always known and believed in, and it was clear, and that at the same time, it's a doctrine that was a seed that evolves into a tree. But let's look at this, this argument from the fact that there's divisions in the Orthodox world, or what's called the Orthodox world, schisms between patriarchates, etc., and the idea that from that from that perspective, the ecclesiology is therefore suspect or fails. Orthodox communions, all of which never tire from finding all sorts of reasons to condemn world orthodoxy, as well as the other non-canonical bodies that don't agree with their particular mission. In Catholicism, you have the breakdown of credibility, morality, and clarity from the hierarchy and the Pope himself. One should choose either one while also not putting their trust in princes. All right. This was 13 hours ago. This, maybe it's later, but I came across this very recently. So I wanted to comment on this. And it, this is the clear example of what someone will say when they have absolutely no knowledge, but they're trying to criticize, no knowledge about something, but they try to criticize that something. Eric Ibarra has shown in many instances like this one that he has no idea what he's talking about when he's talking about the Orthodox Church. So let me get through step by step what's wrong with it. So first of all, he's attributing the schisms between the uh, Church of the East and the Monophysite churches, Syria, Coptic, Ethiopic, and whatnot, to us. And this is, and if you, and if you remember, this is exactly what Timothy Flanders and Taylor Marshall did against us. They did the same exact thing. Now, none of them know church history, so they might be a bit surprised. But with a, with a two-minute Google search, you can find out that these churches schism in the fifth and sixth centuries. Now, if, you, if you're a Christian, if you're an apostolic Christian, you know what the problem with this is. If you're attributing these schisms to us, you're inadvertently admitting that we are the true church. And you're also admitting that you didn't even exist back then. Because if they believe that they existed back then, they will attribute those schisms to their own church. They will say they schismed from us, but instead they're saying they schismed from the Orthodox. Meaning that... Yeah, I mean, hopefully we understand the argument here, right? That... Ibarra thinks that the Nestorian church, the Coptics, that that's a schism in the Orthodox church. Are you serious? They schismed from when you believe it was the Roman Catholic church united East and West for the first thousand years. Can you see how stupid this is? At that time, we were the true church and they didn't even exist back then. This is very simple. I have no idea why people even make this argument. It just makes them look even stupider than they are. And it's, frankly speaking, an embarrassment. I mean, if this is the level of apologetics that we have to do, give me a break. This is, this is you can look up Google two minutes and you'll already know what's wrong with this argument. But I also want to add this. If you watch my Eastern Catholicism uh, re uh, refutes Rome video, which is one of my most... So people are saying that he's low. Let me try to up this. Popular videos. You can find out that this argument actually applies to them because they are, while they're not 
I emphasize, they're not in communion with us. They're not in communion with the Orthodox. They're not in communion. I'm gonna try to up his volume here. Hold on. Son, we're grabbing burgers for dinner if you're interested. Uh, I'm vegan, Walter. Video spontaneously because I came across this comment by. Is that better? Online apologist Eric Ybarra. Now this is someone that we know, and the comment is mind-numbingly stupid. Re uh, refutes Rome video, which is one of my most popular videos. You can find out that this argument actually applies to them because they are while well, they're not. I emphasize they're not in communion with us. They're not in communion with the Orthodox. They're not in communion with the Church of the East. Nor are they in communion with the Monophysite churches. However, however, they are in communion with the Surah Malabars and the Chaldeans, which believe the same exact thing as the Church of the East believes. They are in communion with the Byzantine Orthodox, which believe the same exact thing that we believe. They are in communion with the Coptics, which perhaps they believe or not. I'm not 100% sure, so I will not make comments on it. And unlike Yubara, when I don't know about something, I do admit that I don't know about something. But I do know that the Byzantine Orthodox and the Church and the Syro Malabars and the Chaldeans do believe something that the Roman Catholic Church does not believe. However, they are the Roman Catholic Church is in communion with these people. So as a matter of fact, this argument applies to him, not to us. And again, you can watch Eastern Catholicism ref refutes Rome video. It's explained right there. It's 13 minutes. More on, he says, we stuck with them until the second millennium, which is, again, very funny. He's actually bringing these schisms to us, but then, oh, you know, they stuck with us. So, I don't know what's going on with this guy. But there are earlier breaks within the East. Earlier breaks within the East. So, he's actually... So, he actually doesn't realize that his examples are the earlier breaks within the East that were part of what he thinks is the Roman Catholic Church. Do you see how stupid these people are? These to us makes no sense again makes absolutely no sense by the way i want to i want to i want to also mention this he he confuses us he confuses us because we have the name orthodoxy right he confuses us with the the church of the east who call themselves orthodox and with the orientals because they call themselves orthodox he confuses us because we have the same name right we both we all call ourselves orthodox I mean, again, these these low IQ comments. So uh, Ubi just did a vi two videos on the history of Orthodox evangelism. So the idea that Orthodox don't care about converts is just like get over these tired old questions and objections. They're, they're just easy to rebut, dude. Just go do some research. Don't be lazy. This is the mistake that not even even an elementary school student let. Not even that a preschooler will not make this mistake. A preschooler will understand that you could have two people. Let's say there are two people and they're both named Samuel. A preschooler will understand that, oh, this Samuel and this Samuel, they have the same. Yeah, so these people literally think that the names, right? It's like that level. <laughs> it's like, well, they use the word orthodox, so they're the same. Uh, now, we're going to get to David's video, but that's the essence of that argument, right? So this uh, attempt to use the Moscow Patriarchate versus the EP problem which is absolutely a real problem. Of course, obviously we are opposed to the EP, always have been, um, in terms of at least learning about this issue, probably seven or eight years ago, I was uh, aware of what was what was really going on with the EP as basically an adjunct of the US State Department. And by the way, that's the case for the Roman Catholic Church and Vatican II, by the way. So I don't know why. I mean, Timothy Flanders can have this person on, right? He can have David Wimhoff on, to interview about this 800 page book, which vindicates the deep state American intelligence apparatus utilizing the Roman Catholic Church, particularly at Vatican II and after. Timothy Flanders has this guy on, right? Interviews. And then when I talk about this, they say it's a conspiracy theory. I mean, these people are like, it's unbelievable, really, what these people do what they think by the way if you want to support uh, i'll be answering the super chats you can super chat through the Streamlabs link which is right here uh go ahead and like and share and in a little bit we'll get to uh, david zoo that's the essence of that argument there and hopefully you get the point here is that the problems in the ecclesiology uh can't be applied as an argument themselves themselves 
when you apply that argument to the first thousand years of what you believe is the Roman Catholic Church. That would mean your church schisms and has problems. And by the way, the, the last 60 plus years and the present day schism going on within the Roman Catholic Church over Francis, does that then disprove the church? Well, if you believe in papal supremacy, yes. If you believe in a uh, decentralized form of church government that orthodoxy does believe in, then it's not a problem. So all of their arguments are actually just premised on the papal understanding of church governance, acting as if the EP is a pope, acting as if the Moscow Patriarch is a tinier pope, like the Church of Rome is the big pope, and then the EP is a littler pope, and then Moscow Patriarch. And, and that's the irony of, you can see that that's obviously how the error in Rome evolved from canon law, how they went from first in honor and synodality and custom, according to the early canons, that Rome's honor is custom, as we'll see in the canons, not divine law, how that evolves into the patriarchal system, the patriarchate system itself also wanting to have, especially with the EP, Roman Catholic type power. Now, ultimately, as we know, the moves of Bartholomew and the EP aren't really about a jurisdictional squabble in the Ukraine or in Macedonia or wherever. These are unfortunately geopolitical issues that relate to Uncle Sam versus Russia. And it goes back to the Cold War and even before that. So ultimately, yes, it's unfortunate that, that this occurs. But my point is that this occurs in the Roman Catholic Church. And so it's not an issue of who has worse problems. It's an issue of which ecclesiology is true or false. Which ecclesiology accords with the first thousand years, which everybody agrees is basically the unified East-West Church. And the canons of the councils are the easiest way to see this because they reflect the mind of the fathers in council, ecumenically and locally. So ecumenical councils in the canons, they even trump individual fathers' opinions. Now, I'm not even saying that, that, that there's this wealth of evidence for papal supremacy in terms of Vatican I in the first thousand years. There's not. And so the whole thing is premised on honor for the Bishop of Rome, canonical privileges for the Bishop of Rome, and Rome and Peter that all equaling Vatican I. That's their, that's their whole thing. So anything that you read anywhere in the canons or in the Church Fathers about Rome is merely interpreted to mean that. And they act like Protestants that texts don't require interpretation. They just mean what they say. Really? Is that how you argue with a Protestant over Sola Scriptura? Don't you say that the text needs the church slash papal interpretation? Of course, that's every Roman Catholic apologist's point. But when it comes to the papal quote minds, no, there's no context needed, bro. It's literally just one sentence out of Augustine, one sentence out of Pope St. Gregory, this thing over here, that thing over there. Quote mind, no context. Most of the time, most of the time. Every now and then when it gets really academic, yes, you can find academic Roman Catholic apologists or uh, writers or scholars who will give some context. But most of the time, at least in the pop uh, scam apologetic crowd, they don't do that, right? It's just click paste over from Catholic answers. So <clears throat> let's look at then Vatican I first, according to EWTN. And we're doing that because I want to show you precisely why some of these people get this wrong. And it's because they don't read the full thing, because they're lazy, because they copy paste, because they quote mine. So at EWTN, the summary, the summary of Vatican I, which by the way, we're gonna, it's decent to have this summary. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a summary, but we want to have this summary and the full point about the universal magisterium at play here as we look at what they try to do. Vatican I's dogmatic constitution, Posture Eternus, first dogmatic constitution, abridged, on the institution of the papist apostolic primacy in Blessed Peter. Now, why are we doing this? Because we want to show that the myriad of opinions, and by the way, every Roman Catholic has his own view of what papal primacy means. Have you noticed this? 
supposedly this is the foundation dogma of the unity of the church. It's going to supply, it's going to provide, it's going to enforce unity in the church, the papacy, the living successor, not the idea of a papacy, the living successor in Rome, as we're going to see in a moment, the living magisterium. That's supposed to give this unity and, and uh, the, the primacy of jurisdiction is going to be exercised such that this unity will be there. Um, and yet, as we will see, 95% of them don't know what the actual dogma of papal supremacy is. They have not read Vatican I. They don't actually know what's in it. I've read all of Denzinger more than, more than once, okay? So we'll, we can break out the Denzinger if we need to. I've always got my Denzinger handy when we're going to go to the Roman Catholic world. And we're going to scroll through the online full Denzinger here in a moment. And we're going to look at the specific sections that refute various trad approaches. So 95% of them think, I only have to follow the extraordinary teachings. And the Pope in any other ways can err. And I don't have to follow it. And I can decide whether he's faithful to tradition or not. Because they will say, the Pope is bound by the tradition. The problem with this is that According to Vatican I, the Pope determines and judges the tradition, not you. Right? You don't have that role and that authority. And we're going to see this in the Vatican I documents very clearly. But remember, first, we're looking at the abridged thing that most of them read because it comes up so easy in the search engine. <clears throat> we teach and declare that according to the gospel evidence, primacy of jurisdiction over the whole church was immediately directly promised to Peter, and conferred on him by Christ the Lord. Now, there's nothing in the Gospels about universal jurisdiction. This is read into the, the passages that everybody knows, right? Matthew 16, 18, 16 to 18. And that that must only mean that Peter can get... So basically, Peter gives the keys to the others. If this were the case, we would see Pete, Jesus breathing on Peter and then Peter breathing on the apostles and saying, whoever sins you remit, they're remitted. Whoever sins you retain, they retain. If this were the case, we would see the Holy Spirit at Pentecost descending upon Peter and then Peter handing it off to the apostles. That's the Roman Catholic model. That, this is saying that that primacy and universality was immediately converted in the gospel to Jesus. And it's not, it's not there. It's an interpretation. Right? And of course, this is the papal authoritative interpretation. So how do we know that this is the case? Because the papacy, who is the highest authority, says it's the case that the papacy is the highest authority according to the gospel. This is the circularity that I talked about. And how do we know what the, what the uh, canon of scripture is according to the Roman Catholic? The papacy. How do we know that the papacy is true? Because it's in the gospels. Okay, so the papacy determines the gospels, which determines the papacy, which determines the gospels. Okay, these are people who believe in foundationalism and not paradigm circular argumentation that's a circular argument which they don't believe in circular arguments at all do you understand this okay do you see that this is saying this so so whether it, the the gospel itself is is arguing this about peter and primacy and universality or not set that aside for a moment i'm talking about an epistemic issue that the authority claims are circular the first appeal here is to the Gospels. You are the Christ, Matthew 16, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. These are the two texts that are given. These are the two texts for that go on to justify all of this stuff. Vatican Bank, right? That the Pope is above every temporal leader in the world. That all kings must bow before the Pope. It's all from these two texts. Now, can anybody with a straight face act like that's not an interpretation of this text or an eisegesis of this text. Does anybody actually think that in the first century, the popes in Rome thought that? That they had temporal supremacy over all rulers in the world. You understand that's a medieval Roman Catholic doctrine, right? I'm not making that up. You've read Unum Sanctum, right? Or is this an egregious case of later evolved doctrines, which they admit evolve. They admit this is a seed thing that develops over time. Now, wait a minute. If it's a seed thing that develops over time, 
then how is that the meaning of these texts at that time? It wouldn't be, you see. And remember, two chapters after Matthew 16, in Matthew 18, Jesus says the very same thing that he said to Peter to the College of the Apostles. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them at Pentecost, each apostle, and by extension in the Orthodox view, each bishop has the fullness of Catholicity. There's no city in one place that is the Catholic city. Do you understand this? Catholicity, even according to them, is restricted to or almost always means universality. Numbers, big numbers. But it's one city, Rome. That's the essence of Catholicity, is one city in Rome. And the again, another way to show that this is not the case is keep in mind that for the first thousand years, it's only necessary for three bishops or for a metropolitan to ordain another bishop. Nothing about Rome. right? And as we look in the canons, we're going to see that all these canons are stated, nothing about Rome in all of these canons. Imagine the Vatican I mindset being at work in each of these canons of these councils as they make all of these canons that contradict Vatican I in every ecumenical council and in local canons and councils too. And then turning around with a straight face and arguing that this view of Vatican I was always the case, but it also evolved. It can't be the case that the doctrine is clear, taught by the church fathers there from the earliest days, and it evolves over time from a seed to a tree. Those are two contradictory, mutually exclusive claims. No one can be in doubt, indeed, that it was known in every age. Here we go. What? That blessed Peter, head of the apostles, pillar and of faith and the foundation of the Catholic Church, Receive the key. So in every age, they're saying this interpretation was true. But we're going to see in a moment, this doctrine was not clear and evolved, but it was known in every age. And the popes knew it in every age. And when you ask a bar, why didn't they exercise it in every age? Well, the pope didn't have access to everything. He couldn't just read and, and, and look at everything. Oh, really? Then how is he going to ratify every bishop in the world? It borrows his own argument that the Pope has to confer with everyone to know what's going on. Makes it impossible that the Pope ought to affirm every bishop in the world. But that's what Roman Catholics after the first thousand years believe. The Bishop, the bishop of Rome signs off on every bishop in the world. And obviously that wasn't the case in the first thousand years because the most that you would have in the synodal collegial patriarchal model is a patriarch, which is an honorary title that comes out of ecumenical councils for big cities, signing off on people in his jurisdiction being ordained. And in the Orthodox Church, guess what? It's still that way. Another point too I'd like to add is that have you ever heard of autocephalous churches? You know this exists in the first thousand years, right? The idea of an autocephalous church. We still have autocephalous churches in the Orthodox Church. Do you think that model, which clearly comes out of the first thousand years of Christianity, makes any sense at all in the Roman Catholic system? I'm not talking about uniates, okay? I know Roman Catholics have uniates. I know they have apostolic, you know, groups that report directly to the apostolic see. I'm aware of all that, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this specific notion of autocephalous churches. If there's an autocephalous church, there's not a super bishop that has universal jurisdiction over the autocephalous churches. And if that idea itself was inherently flawed and wrong, then there would not have been autocephalous churches under the first thousand years, which Roman Catholics believe was the Roman Catholic Church. Do you see how silly this is? But note that in this summary there, in point two again, 
This is the one, this is the text I'm always hearkening to. No one can doubt. There's, there's no doubt that in every age, everyone knew that Peter was the head of the apostles, the pillar of faith and the foundation of the Catholic church, Peter himself. And that he received the keys from the Lord. And that to this day, he lives and presides and exercises his judgment in the successors in Rome. So let's get clear, Roman Catholics. He's not a symbolic person. He's not a, uh, it's not like he doesn't actually represent Peter in every living successor. Peter is in the successors judging. And everyone always knew this in every age. In every age, no doubt. That's what it says. Keep that in mind when we look at the canons of every ecumenical council enacting canons with the mind of the whole church in that time period in each council that are totally contradictory to that, meaning that not in every age and in every council there's doubt that no one believed and thought that way. Have these people not read Ratzinger? What did he say? in introduction of Christianity. The first thousand years of the church was collegial, synodal, and the orthodox model. This is why there's autocephalous churches. And do you begin to see then why this model has for so many years and for so long in the last millennium been backed up by forgeries, frauds, deceptions, and scams that the Vatican now admits are forgeries. Again, as Ubi has said many, many times, if you guys have the goods, if Rome had the goods, why was there a need to create all these Roman forgeries to back up things like the temporal supremacy of the Roman bishop? I mean, you understand that pseudo-Isidorian decretals are appealed to in the Catechism of Trent. Where was the Holy Spirit, by the way, in allowing the Pope to know that forgeries were there? Uh, Wait a minute. So the Holy Spirit didn't guide the Roman See to know the forgeries that were backing up the temporal supremacy of the Roman See? The Galatian Decretals, the Donation of Constantine, all these famous forgeries, Symmachian forgeries. Well, the Pope don't know everything. He... He got to talk to other people and figure it out. Oh, Ibarra says. Oh, wait a minute. So is that why Leo's tome is investigated at Chalcedon? Does it sound like this model of the church is a model where the council investigates the, the Pope's letter to see if it's orthodox? Or does it sound like the Pope investigates the council and decides if the council is orthodox okay come on anybody who knows anything about vatican one knows that it's the second one (laughs) the second one is the roman catholic view the first one is the orthodox view and that's why they examine agatho's letter to see if it's orthodox that's why they examine leo's tome to see if it's orthodox if they believed as point two says that in every age Everybody knew that Peter judged in his successors. They would not judge for days and weeks, in some instances, the Pope's decisions and decrees and letters to see if they're orthodox. Therefore, whoever succeeds in the chair of Peter obtains by the institution of Christ the primacy of Peter over the whole church so that the truth has ordained and stands firm. Blessed Peter preserves the rock-like strength that was granted and does not abandon the guidance of the church which he received for this reason has been necessary for every church. That is to say the faithful throughout the world to be in agreement with Rome because of the preeminent authority in consequence. That's a quote from Irenaeus, which we did a whole stream with Ubi, by the way, which I'll link below. If you want to see how that's misused. The funny thing about that is that the actual full quote of Irenaeus says that the reason Rome is preeminent is because of the doubly apostolic foundation of Peter and Paul. And Vatican I later says that you cannot say that Rome is preeminent because of 
Peter and Paul. No, no, Paul has nothing to do with this. In their view, it's only because Peter died in Rome. Okay, because they know Peter established Antioch, right? The Petrine Sea is known to be Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, even all the way up into Pope St. Gregory the Great. And yes, Rome is listed first. Why? Because it's doubly apostolic. And they also don't mention the fact that Irenaeus himself had no problem telling Pope St. Victor that he was wrong and that his excommunication of attempt to excommunicate a gigantic portion of the church was invalid. Does that sound like Irenaeus really believed in point two? No, because Irenaeus is not promoting or teaching the Vatican I doctrine. That's a doctrine that evolves. So then it goes on to say, uh, on the power and character primacy of Roman pontiff, and so supported by clear witness of Scripture, and adhering to the manifest explicit decrees of both predecessors of the Roman pontiffs and the general councils, we promulgate anew the definition of the Ecumenical Council of Florence, which must be believed by all faithful Christians, namely that the Holy Apostolic See and Roman pontiff holds a worldwide primacy, and that the Roman pontiff is the successor to Blessed Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, the true Vicar of Christ, the whole head of the church, and the father and teacher of all Christian people. To him, to uh, Blessed Peter, full power has been given to, uh, to rule and to govern and blah, blah, blah. This is to be found in the Acts of the Ecumenical Councils and Sacred Canons. You see this? So they're claiming, it's going to claim here that this above quote is in the Ecumenical Councils and Canons. Now, if they mean Florence, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but in the first thousand years, we're going to see that that's not the case. Wherefore, we teach and declare by divine ordinance, the Roman church possesses preeminence and ordinary power over every other church. And that this jurisdiction and power of the Roman pontiff is both Episcopal and immediate. That means it's not given to him by a council. It is not given to him by the Roman college. It is not given to him by another bishop. It is not given to him by the church as a whole, separate from him. The clergy and the faithful of whatever right and dignity, singly and collectively, are bound to submit to this power by the duty of the hierarchical subordination and true obedience. True obedience. And not only in matters of faith and morals. Do you hear this? Because this is what every 95% of the Roman Catholics do, is they say that only in the matters of faith and morals, when I read about it and when I decide I'm going to follow Francis, am I bound to follow it? I'm going to pick and choose, like the Protestants that I hypocritically always talk about, picking and choosing. I'm going to pick and choose with the papal documents because I'm a papal sola scripturist. Only the matters of faith and morals that I find relevant. Uh-oh but also in regard to the discipline and government of the church throughout the world. Do you hear that trads? Do you hear that SSPX? Do you hear that FSSP? Do you hear that conservative Novus Ordos who think that you can reject Francis, who is the living successor of Peter, according to this? Are you only bound to faith and morals? 90% of you, of that crowd, say this. I'm only bound to what he says in terms of true obedience in faith and morals. The very public abridged definition that all of you guys go to says that's not all that you're bound to. True obedience is not only in matters of faith and morals, but also in those things which regard discipline and government in the church. That right there refutes a gigantic portion of the delusion of the trad world. And when I was SSPX, when I went to the Latin Mass for many years, I believed that. I thought that, yes, I am, we have the right to sit back, dig into the books, and decide if the Pope is being faithful to tradition or not. And we're going to judge that he's not, and that Vatican II is optional. Does this sound anything like that? Does it sound like you have the option to decide? It's time to be honest with yourself, as I was, that you either stick with Francis, if you believe the system, or you're done. There's no Roman Catholicism without Francis. 
And this is the abridged, clear-as-day doctrine of Vatican I for everybody. Can you have Roman Catholicism without Francis? Can you have Roman Catholicism with Francis and only the things that you want? I only care about, what, what did they all say? I'm only bound to the Pope's ex cathedra statements. That's half of them. The other half of them say, well, I'm only bound to the Pope's ex cathedra statements and the things that I judge him to be faithful to in terms of tradition. That is the direct opposite attitude of what this says. True obedience is not only matters of faith and morals, but also disciplinary and government. That means the sacraments. That means you don't judge which sacraments are valid. You don't judge the rites. You don't judge who's excommunicated, SSPX. You don't have the right to say, I reject John Paul II's excommunication of Lefebvre. Because when you do, you are under the condemnation of Vatican I. Thus, and by the way, I can show you in Denzinger where they get that. That's all in Denzinger. What, that, what they just said right there is in Denzinger. I've covered this in multiple live streams for you guys for at least four years now. That very point. In this way, unity in the Roman Catholic Church and communion, a profession of the same faith, the Church of Christ becomes one flock under the shepherd, supreme shepherd. This is the teaching of the Catholic faith. No one can depart from that without endangering faith and salvation. Do you hear that, Roman Catholics? If you don't believe what I just said, you are schismatic and a heretic. You will lose your salvation if you think that you can pick and choose and that true obedience only applies to the things that you want to believe. To the things that you think Francis is faithful to. This power of the Supreme Pontiff no way, in no way detracts from the ordinary immediate power of the Episcopal jurisdiction. I'm talking about the rest of the bishops. Who have succeeded to the place of the apostles by the appointment of the Holy Spirit. They tend and govern individually the particular flocks which have been assigned to them. On the contrary... This power of theirs is asserted and supported and defended by the supreme universal pastor. Pope St. Gregory the Great says, My honor is the honor of the whole church. My honor is the steadfast strength of the brethren. There do I claim, then do I receive true honor when it's denied to none, none of them to whom honor is due. Okay, yep. I mean, him saying, you notice the way that, I mean, multiple patriarchs and bishops speak this way. Basil says, The See of Antioch is the head of the world, the head of the church, the head of all churches. And nobody believes that the Bishop of Antioch is the head of the church, but they take flowery prose and then read into that Vatican one. That's literally what they do to the quote minds. Furthermore, it follows from the Supreme power, which the Roman pontiff has in governing the church. They has the right and the performance of the office to communicate freely with the pastors and flocks of the church to guide them into salvation. And therefore we condemn and reject the opinion of those who hold that this communication of the Supreme head with the pastor and flocks lawfully be obstructed. So you can't obstruct the Pope doing this stuff or that it should depend on the civil power, which uh, leads them to maintain that the, what is determined by the apostolic see or by its authority concerning the governance of the church has no force unless it is confirmed by the civil authority. Uh, then it goes on to say that he judges the whole church. He is a supreme judge. All cases uh, fall under ecclesiastical jurisdiction and recourse that, to his judgment. The sentence of the apostolic see, to which there is no higher authority, is not subject to revision by anyone. In matters of discipline as well. And then it says, of course, that the judgment of the Roman pontiffs are not subject uh, to ecumenical counsel. Nor is it lawful to appeal uh, from the judgments of the Roman pontiffs to a council. No, councils are not above the popes. So Roman primacy, which the Roman uh, pontiff possesses as a successor of Peter and the prince of the apostles, includes also the supreme power of, of this teaching of teaching. Holy See has always maintained this. The constant custom of the church 
demonstrates it in the ecumenical councils, particularly those in the East and the West, which uh, met in the union of faith and declared it. So anyway, you get the point there, which, and then it goes on to quote things like Florence, which obviously we don't accept, but the point there was just to stress that the doctrine is really clear and it's even clear in the things that, that are abridged that you can't pick and choose. Now that right there refutes 90% of what they do, right? But another thing I want to point out to these people, which a lot of them are not, are not aware of, which we have talked about many times, is the ordinary magisterium. So if you go to the papal encyclicals.net, chapter three on faith, the full Vatican one says by divine Catholic and faith, all those things would be believed, which are contained in the word of God, found in scripture and tradition, which are proposed by the church matters would be believed uh, as divinely revealed by their by solemn judgment or ordinary universal magisterium. So you're bound to not just ex cathedra, but also universal ordinary teaching. And that's, I'm going to put that in the chat for you guys here. So the point of all this, again, is just to say that there's no such thing as Catholicism without the guy in Rome. Uh, you got to be with Francis or it's no thing, right? So there is the papal encyclicals for you, which is the full text of Vatican I and not the abridged text. The abridged text is that EWTN, but even the abridged text says the very things that I've been hammering over and over. And if you look over, here is the 1 Peter 5 uh, theologian who summarizes this point for you. I'll put that article as well. If you want a, a summary article getting at this point, Here's the definitions, the cheat sheet that they have. Magisterium, the teaching office of the Pope in, or the bishops in union with the Pope. Extraordinary magisterium, non-ordinary solemn teaching. That is ecumenical councils and ex-cathedra. <laughs> Advertisement, that's not part of it. Ordinary magisterium, part of the regular teaching duties. Universal magisterium taught by the entire church. Thus, you are not only bound. Remember what the EWTN abridged summary said you're not only bound by the ordinary the extraordinary teaching you're also bound by the universal magisterial teaching which is ordinary and you are bound with docility to submit to the ordinary magisterium that's not universal and then it goes on to say that infallible are the things that are irreformable non-infallible things that are reformable so even if for example uh i don't I mean, whether this is the case or not, if a pope, for example, uh, theoretically, say, reversed an excommunication, even if you believe the excommunication is wrong, you don't have the right and the authority to reject the excommunication. That's the point I'm getting at here. Because it no, as, you, as you saw, it says you're, you're bound to submit to the disciplinary decisions as well. Now, over here on that's not what I'm looking for. In Denzinger 1578, <clears throat> can a Roman Catholic um, reject rights that he doesn't like or that he thinks needs to be reformed? Do you have the right as a Roman Catholic to criticize? the liturgy that's approved by Rome. Well, if you read that right there, you will see that it, you cannot. I'm not going to read the whole paragraph. You can read it. I know some of you guys are like super lazy, but the Spirit of God could, uh, in other words, it's condemning this position, that the Spirit of God could have established disciplines which are not only useless and burdensome for Christian liberty to endure, but which are even dangerous and harmful, leading to superstition and materialism. These are false, rash, scandalous, dangerous, and offensive to pious ears, injurious to the church and to the spirit of God by whom it is guided. And this is because some of the Jansenists were saying, Jansenists were arguing that the church 
could uh, Rome could give defective sacraments and that they needed to be reformed. Rome cannot give defective sacraments to the church according to Octorum Fide, 1578. And yet a gigantic portion of the Roman Catholic world and the tribes believes that the Vatican II sacraments, if they're not even invalid, according to the Sedevacontis, they're at least defective and problematic and that the Vatican that, and that Rome has promoted the very things that this document says cannot happen. Now, next, I want to play just a little clip here again of David's video that really drives this home before we get to the what the ecumenical canons themselves say. So let's watch David's video and remind ourselves uh, of what is going on in terms of Eastern Catholicism and why this is a problem. And I'm going to play the whole video. I don't think David will care. Uh, I'm going to link his video as well. So be sure and go over here and support. David, if you don't, because this is a great video and it bears repeating because, of course, the Lofton reason and theology circles are Eastern Catholics. So let's listen to this. People say, well, we're Eastern Orthodox because of this, this and that. And a Roman Catholic will say, well, that sounds really beautiful, but uh, why are you not Eastern Catholic? And they think that's a gotcha mode. They think that's a argument that disproves our position. But actually... It disproves the Roman position. So the Eastern Catholics refute Rome. And this is the video where I will illustrate that. So before we even go ahead, I will talk to you about, uh, well, what we're going to be talking about in this video. We're going to be covering the meaning of Eucharist. This is very important, actually. Uh, then we're going to look at Eastern Rite theology as opposed to Latin Rite theology. And then we're going to look at Eastern Rite saints then and now, so the past and the present of Eastern Rite saints. So what does it even mean to commune? It means that you believe the body and blood of Christ is present in that church. You also believe that that church really does have the sacraments. Most importantly, communing in a church is an implicit affirmation that that church preaches true doctrine. So as an example, you as a Roman Catholic will not commune in a Protestant church. Why? Well, because Protestantism is just wrong. It preaches false doctrines, right? So when you partake in the Eucharist of a church, you're basically saying this church has a correct doctrine. This church preaches truth. Keeping that in mind, as we all know that the Eastern Catholics and, the, and Rome are in communion with one another, so this should mean that they have a unified theology, right? That is not the case. Actually, there are many theological contradictions between the East and West. Many Eastern Catholics, particularly today, still hold to Orthodox theology. It will not be wrong to say that the theology is very much the same as Eastern Orthodox theology, which explicitly shows the irony in modern trap camps attempting to refute so-called polemism. If this so-called polemism uh, in this in the Roman Catholic Church today is considered just as valid just as Scotism is or, or Thomism is why even argue against it when Roman Catholics try to argue against orthodoxy they're actually arguing against their own theology and this is ultimately ironic uh, I have a screenshot here uh, two screenshot actually the screenshot below which is from Light of Life Catechism, which is an Eastern Catholic Catechism, um, it says that the Eastern Catholics believe that there are only seven ecumenical councils, and they reject, reject Vatican II as an ecumenical council. And then you look at Rome, and they will say, well, there's, naturally, there's 21 ecumenical councils. If you're SSPX, it will say, well, there's 20 ecumenical councils, right? So you have two conflicting views. You have conflicting views regarding the SS Energies distinction and ADS. There's a screenshot above, which is from the Melkite website, which talks about how the light of Mount Tabor was a manifestation of God's uncreated divine energy, comprehensible by the apostles. So you can see that they're preaching actually polemism. So in the East, you have SS Energies distinction, but in the West, ADS is dogmatized. This is why you have uncreated grace in the Eastern Rite theology, and then you have created grace in the Roman Catholic theology. And so the East 
teaches doctrines that are contrary to Western dogma. S this is very much similar to purgatory. The uh, You will see Eastern Rite uh, Catholic churches rejecting the purgatory teaching. And also regarding the filioque, Eastern Catholics reject the filioque. This rejection might not be on a full-on dogmatic level as you will expect, but it's evident in the creed. Eastern Catholic parishes, several of them, refuse to recite the filioque in the creed. Now what is the creed? The creed is an is a confession of faith. While you can indeed have confessions of faith that emphasize different parts of the faith, you cannot have a contradictory confession. So Rome confesses that the Holy Spirit is hypostatically possessed from the Father and the Son as a single principle. Whereas in the East, they completely remove the Son. So they say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father as a sole principle. So by not reciting the filioque, the Eastern Catholics are pretty much rejecting the doctrine of filioque. Rome dogmatized clergy to be celibate, this is evident in Denzinger uh, 119. However, now that the dogma seems to be ignored if you're Eastern Catholic. Now you might say, well, the Eastern Catholic is autocephalous, and you might have a point there, but it still shows that there's some sort of discrepancy between the East and the West. Finally, and this will be a huge claim, this might surprise a lot of you, you could have Nestorian Christology and be Roman Catholic. Hi, I'm Laura Smith. I'm a nutritionist and director of program innovation at W. So let's look at the example of the Syro Malabar and the Chaldean Catholic Church. They have the anaphoras of Mar Adai and Mar Mari. They have the anaphora of Theodoret of Mopsuestia, who, by the way, is the father of Nestorianism. And last but not least, they have the anaphora of Nestorius. Now, they don't name these. Uh, these Nestorian fathers, uh, and these Nestorian fathers, fathers will include uh, Theodoret, Nestorius, Diodorus of Tarsus, but that is actually arguably worse because instead of naming them, they're referring to them as Greek doctors of the church, not only fathers, but Greek doctors. So you don't use the anaphora of a heretic, you use the anaphora of a saint. And this shows that in the Syro Malabar Church and in the Chaldean Catholic Church, Nestorius is a saint. So if we look at the status of saints, it is just as confusing as the theology. Again, with Nestorius, now think of it this way. So you so Nestorius is now a saint, but for all this time, for more than a millennium, he was a heretic. And the Council of Ephesus, which is an ecumenical council that both Rome and East affirms, uh, now suddenly Council of Ephesus was wrong in condemning him. He was a saint all along. So Nestorius was a great pious saint all along, and Ephesus was wrong in condemning him. This is, this is just stupid. Let's look at the Roman destroyers. And what I mean by Roman destroyers, I will be referring as St. Palamas, St. Mark of Ephesus, Ephesus, and St. Photius. And we know that there are saints in the Roman Catholic Church now because the Byzantine Catholics use the Menayan V years. We have the same Menayan, so we have the same saints as they have. And so we know that the saints, uh, Palamas, Mark, Photius, are all saints in the Roman Catholic Church. Let's look at St. Palamas. His doctrines are considered, uh, were considered heretical, and by a lot of Roman Catholics today, they're still considered heretical. But can these anti palamites please explain to me how is how saint gregory palamas is a saint now so for centuries rome rejected palamite theology rome rejected saint gregory palamas called him a heretic and now he's suddenly a great pious saint this does not make any sense what about saint photius according to the robert council of constantinople 4 which is the council that is affirmed as an ecumenical council by the Roman Catholics, the council at 869 uh, between 870, St. Photius was deposed. St. Photius was condemned. That council, that council, I would like to remind you, is considered as an ecumenical council by Rome. And Rome rejects the Orthodox Council of Constantinople IV that commenced 10 years later. 
but somehow Saint Photius is now a saint. And let's look at Manuel Evgenigos, which we will also call Saint Mark of Ephesus. I'm sure everyone knows of his antics in the Council of Florence. He basically called the Roman Catholic Church a heretical church because of the filioque. So the guy that called your church a heretical church that rejected the union is now a saint in your, ger in your church? Again, none of this make any sense. These people should not be saints in the Roman Catholic Church, yet they are. So, as a, so really you have three different options here. All right. So let's play a game called who is right and who is wrong. Look at, let's look at the three different options. The first option will be that the Eastern Catholics and the Latin Catholics are both correct. However, as you can see in this video, that is impossible because Rome and the Eastern Catholics hold contradictory doctrines. So either one of them is right and the other is wrong or neither are just wrong. Both cannot be correct. Secondly, Rome is correct and the Eastern Catholics have false doctrines. If that is the case, then why are you in communion with those that hold false doctrines? That still disproves your position. Third, Rome is actually wrong and that the Eastern Catholics are right. And we will say, yes, that is actually kind of correct. But then what is the point of being in communion with Rome? Why are you, again, why are you in communion with those that hold false doctrines? And now you might say, well, because of papacy. We believe in papal supremacy. We believe that the Pope is infallible. If the Pope is truly infallible, then you won't be saying that the doctrines are wrong because the Pope will never hold a wrong doctrine under papal supremacy. Yet you are here telling me that Rome is wrong. So what's the option? Well, you can just be orthodox instead, right? You can just be orthodox instead. And this goes to Roman Catholics themselves too. You can also just be, a Ro you can just be a orthodox instead because it shows evidently that your church holds contradictory doctrines and accepts those that hold heretical views. Numerous church fathers in scripture tells us to stay away from heretics and their doctrines. We see in scripture 2 John 11, uh, anyone who welcomes a heretic, anyone who welcomes him, shares his work. We see <coughs> in Rome that they welcome heretical doctrines, in their view, of course. St. Paul in his epistle to Romans in 1617 tells us to separate ourselves from those who hold heretical doctrines. St. Polycarp recites a story of St. John where he flees from a bathhouse because a heretic was in that bathhouse. So not only does St. John think that being in communion with a heretic is scandalous, being in the same location with a heretic to him was scandalous. So we can see in the Roman Catholic Church, they hold the opposite approach. What they're really doing is akin to telling Arius that he can still have his own Arian right church and be in communion with Rome. Imagine telling Nestorius after condemning him in Ephesus that he can just reject Ephesus, go form his own Nestorian right church, and then be in communion with Ro Rome. This is utterly absurd. It does not make any sense. And this illustrates that the Roman Catholic Church is absurd. And so to recap, Eastern Catholics prove Rome wrong, and by extension they prove us right. Because both churches hold contradictory doctrine, Rome is also in communion with Nestorian churches. People that both the Orthodox and the Catholic will agree are heretical. Eastern Catholicism tries to hold a middle position between Catholicism and Orthodoxy. The third Newton Eparch, Bishop John, says in his website that you can attend Antiochian Orthodox religious services and pray with them. <laughs> Basically telling you to pray with those that are outside the Roman Catholic Church, telling you that you can pray with heretics. This contradictory nature of what Rome has become today shows that the Roman Church proves that orthodoxy is correct. Exactly. Now, uh, in order to... Let me turn the volume back up here. In order to keep the length of this video down uh, not to three, four hours, what I'm going to do instead is a <clears throat> live stream tomorrow that will be the part two of this. And instead of... Uh, 
making it a part two that is for subscribers only. It's going to be public for a little while and will then also be later made for subscribers only. So um, the stream that I do this part two tomorrow, again, it's going to be uh, dealing with one by one the canons and how the canons of each of the, uh, of the seven councils runs contrary to what we've seen so far in, in Vatican I. Uh, we're going to look at other theologians like Ott, and we're going to look at some of the uh, classical proof texts and the scriptures that are used to bolster this case. And we're going to look at some of the revisionist examples, like David had said, from people like St. Gregory Palamas, who wrote entire treatises calling the Filioque satanic. And then, of course, for many centuries being considered heterodox. And then, of course, nowadays in Rome, he's not. So the mere fact that you can be a heretic for centuries and then have the status revised, which is David's whole point here in this video, shows that it's not a monolithic, singular, consistent faith, which is what it claims to be. It constantly evolves and revises itself and changes its positions. And it does that to bolster whatever the argument is at the time. Now, remember, how contrary is what you just saw <laughs> with this attitude towards the Uniates to what we just read in Vatican I. Does Vatican I make it sound like uh, the, that Vatican I is optional? Do you have the right to pick and choose doctrines and saints if you're a Uniate? Of course not. And yet the whole thing is premised on revisionism. I mean, you had Jimmy Aiken the other day saying that uh, in his video, maybe he slipped up, but he said Nestorius and Arius were uh, actually died orthodox, right? I played that video. And so here we go. I mean, this is just the circus of the pop apologists, right? It's, uh, it's all built on revisionism. And, and this alone, if you grasp this point about the Eastern Catholics, you understand that Roman Catholicism is not about a unified faith because you don't have to have a unified faith. In fact, you are permitted to have a disunified faith. The only thing that you have to have faith in is the papacy. You can believe almost anything you want nowadays under Francis, as long as you accept the doctrine of the papacy. And that itself is one of the best proofs that Vatican I and the papacy refute one another. They're self-refuting. So tomorrow, uh, probably in the evening, we will have part two. I'll go through each of the canons, and hopefully this will be a good starting point for a lot of the trads, a lot of the Roman Catholics that... Uh, you know, have been asking me a lot of questions in the last week, um, all over in, in multiple uh, formats, multiple uh, apps and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, so tomorrow night we'll do part two and then that part two will not be public forever. So that will be only for subscribers, but because I do want to, uh, have this public for a while, I, I want people to see this, especially mainly the trads that are the Roman Catholics that have been asking us questions that are most interested in this topic. So, they, uh, you know, I want them to have access to it. And then probably after a few days, it will, you know, be marked uh, private for subs only. And tomorrow also, I will read uh, the super chats that went along with this stream and the rest of the super chats that come in tomorrow on part two. So everybody have a good night. Uh, hopefully this was a, a, a more compact, uh, easily digestible uh, topic. And really, I want to have the two videos separate anyway. So this video focuses on the basic principle of Vatican I. And then the next video will be the basic principles of the canons of the seven councils. And then the two videos together will show 